We're kind of coming to the close here of 2 Corinthians 4, and then I'm going to jump over into another passage in 1 Thessalonians, because there's obviously more things than just in what's 2 Thessalonians, 2 Corinthians, uh, that can teach you about what you need to be learning in church. And again, we started off on this study a couple of weeks ago, just to give you an idea what it is you should be looking for. And for those of you that are visiting, so that you become a bit more accustomed that when you get the Bible in church, instead of a, a program, that you realize, oh, well, I guess that's okay to get the Bible in church. Amen. You know, it's great to have a good time in church. Um, and, but it needs to be focused or centered around what God's doing. Amen. And the only thing that'll last you in a long time is what God does for you. Those are memories that uh, they won't leave you very soon. And so the Apostle Paul laid out some things here for you. I'm going to pick it up in verse 16. I'm going to go through this a little bit from this morning. And then we're going to run, run back down to, uh, through this and then jump over if we can to 1 Thessalonians. Verse 16, chapter 4, For which cause we faint not. For though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed when? Day by day. Day by day. There's good reason to read your Bible. The Apostle Paul said, I die daily. daily. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding eternal... I'm in 2 Corinthians. I didn't give you that, did I? Yes. All right. All right. Worketh for us an exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we, all, while we look not at the things which are what? Seen. seen. But at the things which are... Not seen. Where would those things be? They'd be in heaven, right? They'd be in glory. They'd be the things by faith. But at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Brother Larry, you pray, would you please, and ask the Lord to help us out here. Lord, we come before you one more time today, in the last part of this Sunday evening. We ask for your help one more time as you did with us this morning. We thank you for meeting with us. We thank you for the opportunity, Lord, and what a privilege it is to have a church, have a pastor, have a preacher and have your presence. God, we thank you for that. Thank you for what you do to do for us through this book and what you actually allow us, God, to be a part of. So I pray for that camp now coming up. Yeah. I yes. pray for the hearts of the ones in the week yeah. before, Lord, yeah. that you continue there. But Lord, this one coming up, we pray fervently, Lord, for this camp, for the hearts of these young people. Lord knows how many will be there, Lord, for all those preachers, for the messages and everything that's done. Help us in this meeting tonight. We're going to give you all the glory in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 Thank you. You can be seated. Now, I do want to draw your attention. I want you to come back over, if you would, please, to 2 Corinthians, or flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I have a reason for do this, because uh, as a Christian, you can wind up losing a number of things. And uh, the one thing you can't lose is your salvation. Amen. Amen. And you want to lock on to that. You say, why? Because the longer you're saved, the more you're going to need it. The more you read your Bible, the more you're going to need it. The more that you listen to preaching, the more you're going to need it. You say, why? Because the devil will love to get you tied up thinking that you've lost your salvation or that maybe you never even had it. And so the longer that you have that, you need to rest in the fact that my salvation is sure. And don't go back to Calvary every time you mess up and try to get resaved. Now, a Christian can lose your testimony and you can lose your character and your possessions and your life. You can even lose your inheritance at the judgment seat of Christ, but you cannot lose your salvation. Now, the Apostle Paul is fixing to talk to you here about what it's like to come to the end of his life. And what he says there is, is he gives you a, a, a key or a, uh, I don't want to call it secret sauce, but he gives you one of the hints as to how to have a successful Christian life. And the success comes in the repetitive behaviors that happen on a regular daily basis. When I talked about habits the other day, one of the things that people don't recognize is if you say you're going to read your Bible or you've been reading your Bible now for three months, let's say, okay, that doesn't mean anything. You say, well, I'm said I'm reading my Bible for three months. Does that mean you read it once a week for three months? Did you read it once a month for three months? Or you say, well, I can't seem to get in the habit of reading my Bible. Habits are ingrained by repetitive doing them. They don't just happen. Look, here's individuals. They come out at the beginning of a season. Let's just use a sports analogy. At the beginning of the season, they all want to win the pennant. Or they all want to win the trophy. Or they all want to win the regionals and the states and all that kind of stuff. All their goals are the same. Only one of them winds up doing that. 
Do you know why that is? That's because that individual finds out what needs to be done and makes adjustments in their everyday practice in order for them to be able to do what they need to do. They study game films. They watch weaknesses. They find out what players have strengths and what players have weaknesses. And they enhance the strengths, yes, but they work hard on the weaknesses. If you don't change what you do on a daily basis, even though your goal is I'm going to read my Bible through once a year, now, I'm going to ask you a point blank question. How many of you have ever said on January the 1st, this is the year I'm going to read through the Bible once a year? Could you just see a show of hands? Has there been a time that that hasn't been true? How about the same show of hands? <laughs> okay, you say, well, why? Was the goal a good goal? Yes. Absolutely, it's a good goal. Why didn't you achieve the goal? Because you didn't practice the habits that allows you to achieve success with that. Uh, how many of you have been in school before in your life? How many of you struggle with more than one course? Did you ever realize that it was a great goal to say that I wanted to make an A or a B in the class? That's a great goal, isn't it? But you know what you have to do in order to make the A or the B? You have to study. Some courses come easy for you. I liked history. I didn't care anything at all about algebra. I had to say this the other day, and I made fun of it, and I shouldn't make fun of it, and I think I even said it to you, but I had to say it at the youth camp. The reason I struggle with algebra had nothing to do with not having the intellect. The reason I had a struggle with algebra is because I was downright rebellious and lazy when it came to studying something that I didn't see the point of studying. I didn't have any character. And teacher could threaten me, whatever, I don't care, man. A plus B equals E. I mean, you know, I thought I was smarter than Einstein. I mean, Einstein thought, you know, pi is square, and I thought it was always round, so I'm like, I ain't listening to that guy, right? <laughs> but the problem is, is that the, the bottom line, when my dad pushed come to shove, he's like, are you doing the best you can? No, and I got to carry the algebra book around. I told you about all that stuff. Do you say, why, I'm try to get it by osmosis? No, I had so many chapters, I had to go through every single day. And when I finally got through with it and he said, did you get through? I said, yes, sir. He said, good, start over. Yeah. Yeah. I was bad with proofs. You ever done proofs? Mm -hmm. You know what proofs are? Proofs are they give you the answer. Yeah. And now you're supposed to figure out the problem. Do you know what this idiot said? <laughs> I said in geometry class to my teacher, I said, well, if you already have the answer, there is no problem. What's the problem? <laughs> That is not the thing to say to your algebra teacher. And so I got chastised there. And then by the time I got home, word had already gotten back. Some little squirrel somewhere told my dad. And by the time I got there, I had a, a little tune-up coming. And after that, I learned to keep my mouth shut in class. But it didn't make sense to me. Here's the answer and here's how they got it. They even showed you how they got it. Like, okay, now figure out what the problem was. And you're supposed to work it backwards or something? And, and all I'm doing is my justification for being lazy. And it sounds like a great argument. Well, I'm never going to use this. I'm not going to be a rocket scientist. <laughs> my teacher could have said, yeah, no joke. <laughs> but, but, but the bottom line is, ladies and gentlemen, you know what I had to learn? I had to learn to change some habits. Now, I'm going to try to show you something here because it's important. Paul just gave you a clue. This is the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul, if there was ever a great Christian, the Apostle Paul is a great Christian. Would you agree with that? Yes, would you agree that you and I would do well if we strive to be like Paul, especially in certain matters? I mean, not just counting it all but dung that we might win Christ and fellowship of his suffering and get the power of resurrect. I, get, I understand that. I'm talking about the, the nuts and bolts, the nitty gritty, the every day. The making up the bed and wiping up around the toilet and washing the dishes and washing the clothes and taking a shower and shaving and getting the hair out of the drain and vacuuming the rug and doing... I mean, that kind of stuff. The stuff you have to do every day. After all the stuff wears off after camp and all the stuff wears off after revival meeting, I mean, sometimes I might leave here on Sunday night, man, and, and we're, we're, we're happy, man. We're doing good. We're going home. And we're singing and stuff like that. And I might be tired, but man, I'm happy as a dead pig in the mud. Boy, and then I get home, and back back then we're not doing it right now. But back then I'd have a peanut butter and banana and mayonnaise sandwich, or I'd have man, you don't eat, don't ooh until you've eaten it. All right, then you can ooh if you don't, just give it to me, I'll eat it. Or ice cream or whatever. The pressure's off, man, and you sit there, and then in the morning Monday comes. And you're not going to meet and you're not preaching, you're not in church, Monday comes. 
and you got to get the car to the shop, and the washing machine's busted, and there's a leak, and there's this, and you're thinking, man, what a drag. And Paul said, you got to die daily. Because of what? Life. The routine of life. Now, I'm going to give you something that will help to make you successful as far as being a Christian is concerned, but you have to practice it. Getting saved is just like that. He does that for you. Amen. Just like that. As quick as you can snap your fingers, man, you get saved. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Will you save me? Maybe somebody heard that today. Amen. Boom. Just like that. They're saved. They're on their way to heaven. After that, you know what it requires? It requires that same old routine duty on a regular basis, day in and day out. I want to read my Bible through. You're not going to read your Bible through just having the goal of reading your Bible through. People all the time tell you, set goals, set goals, set goals. Let me take that out of your mind for just a moment, okay? Don't set goals, create habits. The goals will take care of themselves. If you learn to do what's necessary for you to do on a daily basis, you'll be surprised how many of those goals you'll achieve without even knowing they were goals for you to achieve. You'll be surprised if you just make up your mind to take a few minutes every day and read your Bible every day and you make that a habit every single day. You know what will happen to you? One day you'll all, I'm, I'm in the New Testament, man. I've already, I read the whole Old Testament. How'd that happen? I just read a little bit every day and instead of saying I'm going to be done by this and I'm going to be done by that, those are supposed to be motivators. They're not motivators. They're discouragers. The great, great thing is, is that I did today what I'm supposed to do today. What does that mean? I got to die daily. This thing right here gets in the way every day. I don't matter what all your problem was and how busy you were and what your schedule was and travel schedule and you came in late and got up early and all that kind of stuff. This thing's always got an excuse for not doing what you need to do. You know what good habits to do? It'll help you overcome that. You have a problem, you get around people, you have a tendency to talk about people. You say, well, why do I do that? You got bad habits that need to be gotten rid of and you need to create good habits. Yep. I'm telling you, to help you, you kids that are in school, you have to develop study habits now. I had a little kid come in there, sit down. I say little, he's little to me. He's 17 years old. He said, the Lord's uh, calling and dealing with him about praying. But he said, I have a hard time uh, sitting down and, and studying. I was just wondering if I can't go here and if I can Google this. And he started using all these terms and all. He's sitting down right across from me. He's real serious minded, the little uh, oriental kid right there. And I said to him, and I said, well, I said, I'm going to tell you what you're looking for. You're looking for things to come in through your top of your head. I said, it doesn't work that way. He's just sitting there like this. And he said, well, what, what do I need to do, preacher? And I said, you need to apply your hind end to the seat you're sitting in. Amen, and you need to spend time reading the book. Yes, Don't worry about studying, clepping courses, getting in a Bible school and doing this and that and the other. I said, you've been saved a little bit of time now. He said, a couple of years. I said, okay, good. You feel like the Lord's dealing with you? Good. I said, okay. Uh, do you know anything about being a carpenter? He said, well, yeah, I know a little bit about, you know, putting stuff together. I said, you think a carpenter knows how to use a hammer and a saw and a, maybe a level or a, you know, a square or something like that? And he goes, well, yes, sir. I said, okay, you think the Lord's calling you to preach? And he said, I believe he might be calling me to preach. I said, have you read the book? He said, well, I never thought of that. I said, see, what you're wanting to do is, is mimic these other people that are preachers and you want me to give you a list of preachers for you to listen to and you're going to listen to their delivery and all that. I said, every good preacher that you know has spent time sitting their hind end in a chair and I said, the way you get that is you get infused from the hind end up, not from the head down. Amen. And I said, what that means is you have to ingrain study habits now. If you can't discipline yourself to sit down and do your reading, you needn't worry about studying. You needn't worry about outlines. You needn't worry about trying to, what you're going to say when you get the opportunity to stand in front of the Senate or whatever it might be. I said, what you have to learn to do is you have to learn to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He said, well, how do you do that? I said, you have to die daily. I said, you got to turn off YouTube, and I lost his eyes. I said, now listen, you're used to seeing images and stuff flashing. Well, I don't watch anything bad. I said, I didn't say you watched anything bad. I said, I'm talking about time. You asked me. You said you're called to preach. We're talking about time, young man. 
We're talking about how and where you spend your time. You are not going to be able to be a preacher if you're not willing to sit down. But that means not only spend the time in reading, it means in order to find the time for reading, something else has got to go. You can't squeeze this thing in there and give what's left over. I said, by the time you get around to it, you're already emotionally wrung out because you've been watching whatever you're watching and whoever the fails are or whatever the stuff is they watch nowadays and that you've been all jacked up about all that kind of stuff. Your mind's a cesspool full of all that stuff. And then you sit down and start trying to read your Bible and your mind is still over there looking at all the cartoons. I said, what you need to recognize is, is that the Lord's dealing with you, but as far as calling to preach, if you're called to preach, you'll know you're called. Well, how do I know I'm called to preach? He gets his pen and paper out there like that, and he's ready to write it down like that. I said, well, one of the ways is, if you want to ask me, is you have a hunger for his word, do you? Come on. Amen. Amen. There you go. And he said, so what you're saying? I said, yeah, what am I saying? He said, you're telling me that before I even need to worry about whether or not I am or ain't, I need to read the Bible. I said, well, why don't we start there? Amen. And then I used an old illustration. I said, when I first became a policeman years ago, he'd asked me a couple of questions about that. I said, the first day that I went out there to school, they handed me a manual about that thick it's called General Orders and one about that thick called SOPs. And I said, they made us sit down and read through those. And every day they would come to the class and they'd walk by and take your book like a little child and grab that, grab that book out of your hands like this. And then they'd flip in there and see if you signed that. And then sometimes they'd have the audacity to say, hey, you signed this. Are you lying when you signed it? Did you really read it? That's why if you look at my Bible, a lot of times you'll see in the, up here in the top left hand corner or over here or somewhere, you'll see my initials. You say, why? Lord, I read that page. Amen. Now, I ain't lying to him. Right. You say, well, they're not all marked. Sometimes I forget. But you know what I remembered? I remember that lesson. And that lesson is, is that they said, that book right there is going to be with you your entire career. And you better learn that book. They gave me that before they gave me state statutes and federal statutes and municipal ordinances. They said, this is how we run this department and you're going to learn that. And then we had to sign them and went through them all the time and take tests on them. Can you imagine that? Well, why wouldn't you? If you're going to be working for somebody, shouldn't you know what they're asking out of you? Amen. And I said, so guess what we had to do? You say, well, did you get to go out to the range and shoot and stuff like that? I said, man, when we first started, you had red-handled guns and bullets with no firing pin in them, man. I said, they didn't trust us with their gun. We were too stupid. And I said, we didn't even get to wear a range. He said, did they call you stupid? I said, yeah, among other things, they sure did. <laughs> and I said, but that was the most important thing in class. You got to know what the book says. You know, it's a funny thing, and I don't know if it's changed down there now, but I know when I was there, you know, it's a strange thing whenever we took tests. You know what? One of the, uh, some of the material was on every single test I took when I went a little ways there. You know, it was on there, general orders, SOPs. Well, why shouldn't it be? It's the agency I'm working for. Well, can I ask you a question? Why, why shouldn't there be time in here if this is what you're going to preach from? If this is what you're going to learn from? If this, you say, what are you going to have to do? When Paul says, I die daily, ladies and gentlemen, he's saying to you that some of the things that you want to do that may not even bad for you to do, some of those things have to die out. You've got to let them go so you can do what God wants you to do. I don't want to give you this idea in your mind that finding time for God's always easy. It is not. You look shocked. Well, if it's so easy, how come most of you, on average, spend less than an hour a day with the Lord? That includes your prayer time, your blessing time, any about reading you do or whatever. Listen, on average, the average for Christians who attend church regularly, the Pew Research says, is an hour a day. If it's not true what I'm saying about making time for Him, then you tell me how come that thing doesn't run two, three, four hours a day? I know you don't have that kind of time. I understand that. But dying says, okay, I can go fishing. I can go hunting. I can go play ball. I can watch what I want to on TV. I can do anything. Okay, good. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, liberty. You use not your liberty to the flesh. Go ahead, help yourself, have a good time and do it. And then you want to know why you don't know the book. You don't spend any time in it. I'm not preaching anything any different than the old preacher preached. The old preacher told you at the same time. Only he used flowerful, flowery, colorful words to call you names and make fun of you. He had a PhD. He had a right to do that. But you know what he'd ask you? He'd ask you questions and go, why don't you know the answer? And then he'd ask you another question. He'd say, well, why don't you know the answer? You, got, you can read, can't you? 
I mean, he put it on you hard. But you know what he's saying? You know what the Apostle Paul is saying? Paul is saying, listen, we got all these things going on in the local church and all these things is what you should be looking for. But a local church should remind you, you have to make time for the Lord. I'm just telling you, I know you love the Lord and I know you believe His book and I know you love the right kind of preaching and I know you know doctrine, but I'm telling you, you can't rest on that. You have to make time for the Lord. And if you don't, you'll just be a biblical buffoon the rest of your life. Still go to heaven. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The Apostle Paul is telling you that. And in this passage here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, he's saying to you, he said, listen, stay on the right path and those kind of things. You can't always trust your feelings. And sometimes you're going to go through things. And if you aren't right with the Lord, you know what you're going to think? You're going to think I'm being punished. Every time something bad happens to you, it doesn't mean that you're being punished. Sometimes something bad happens to you because you're doing something right. Look, and I won't take the time to read it all. Pick it up in about verse number uh, 23 and come all the way down to verse number 30 or 31 there in 2 Corinthians 11. Do you see that? And the Apostle Paul is the one telling you you've got to die daily. You can't take that kind of abuse if you're alive for yourself. You say, why? You're going to be defending yourself over half of those things. You ever have people talk about you? You ever have people falsely accuse you? If you're not dead to yourself. You all been to a funeral before, hadn't you? Most of you. Most of you. Maybe the kids haven't. You've been to a funeral before, right? You walk by the box. You can say anything you want about the person in the box. They don't ever say anything to you. Amen. They just give you that kind of, I just pass gas smile, you know, and they're just, you know, there and they're, you know, don't he look natural? No, he looks dead, you know. And you can go by there and say, man, your makeup's messed up. Man, you ugly. Your mama dresses you funny. Man, you old hypocrite, you or whatever. He... That's it. If you die daily, you know what'll happen? You don't get all hung up in what people are saying about you. Yeah. You, know what, you know what it says to you when you get all worried about what everybody's saying about you? It shows you're too much alive. Yes. Right. Do you see how they talked about Paul? Do you see what they did to Paul? You see what they did to the Lord? How much time did the Lord come back and defending himself? None. You say, why? He's dead. The walking dead man. Now, if Paul gives you a lot of those things in that passage there. Come back to first, or 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Paul gives you a lot of those things here to try to help you, to encourage you. But I want to tell you this. Creating good habits, which is where I started off here, is something that will benefit you no matter what you do. I'm sorry you're hot. I'm trying to help you not to have to cover up in blankets. But I'm doing okay up here. I can, I can take a shower when I get home, even though I feel like I'm in a sauna. But at any rate, um, I, I want you to be comfortable. How many of you are hot? Majority rules. Could you help me out, please, sir? We got pregnant women in here. They're in danger. A lot of estrogen in the room right now, man. Help them out. We have some people going through whale paws, man. I mean, help them out, man. Keep them happy. We'll make it so cold you can hang meat in here. <laughs> hey, I'm, 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 I'm with you, man. I'm with you. I don't want to break out in no sweat for no reason. <laughs> you laugh. You wait till your time's coming. <laughs> All right, now notice the Apostle Paul here in verse number 16. He said no, something else. We faint not. Can I just say this? We don't quit. You don't give up. In the last days, you know what happens? Throwing in the towel becomes an Olympic sport. and Everybody wants to win the gold medal. You have to fight against that. He's telling you right now, in the last days, you know what's going to happen? People are going to depart from the faith. You have to fight against that. He puts that in there so you don't have to do it. You have to fight against that. Well, I don't have a reason to go. All the reasons will be good reasons. Every reason you've ever come for not coming to church, every reason that you've ever had is a good reason. It's good enough to keep you out of church. You know what you have to do? You have to overcome those things. Paul said, we faint not. God ever done anything for you? Amen. Some of you are sitting at home right now. God helped you. And God got you where you are. And boy, you'll never desert God. And God's been good to me. And God's been a blessing to me. If it hadn't been for God this and hadn't been for God that, hadn't been for God so on and so forth, they couldn't find you if the FBI was looking for you. You say, what? You got amnesia. You think just because you messed up or just because things aren't going your way or just because you got an ailment now, you think God's not looking at the eternal picture? 
You think he minds if you get back in if you haven't been faithful and if you have backslid or you're out of fellowship? You think he minds if you decide to get up and come back from the prodigal from the pig pen? I don't think the Lord minds at all. I think he's up there every night hoping you'll come home. I think every night he's sitting there saying, come on, man, get back in now. Come on now, cut it out, get back in. He goes over there to Pete at the end after Pete made a mess of things, boy. And Pete comes up there on that beach, man. I think the Lord, the same hand, if I could paint, I'd have the same hand. I'd have it almost like a mirage in there. I think the same hand that reached down and pulled Peter up there when he was drowning, I think the Lord stuck that hand out again right there. And he said, come on. You know what he's saying to Peter? I understand. I understand the mess. I understand what you did. I understand you betrayed me. I understand you left me. I get all that kind of stuff right here. Here, let me help you get back in. Amen. Pull him right back on the beat. Oh, preacher, you're just ridiculous. Man, you ain't never lived until you had that same hand reach down there and pull you out of that pit again. You ain't never lived until you come back and say, Lord, it's me again. And you're sitting there and drowning and your coat's weighing you down and you're thinking, man, Lord, you don't want me and all that kind of stuff. He say, I'm aware of all that stuff. Lord, that's the same same hand you extended when you saved me. I know. Still the same hand. Come here. Let me help you get up here. And brings him up there. I don't think he brings him up the way that most people think. I think when he latched onto him this time, I think Pete's hand went right in that nail print. And I think he says to him without saying anything, he said, you feel that boy? And Peter said, yes, sir, Lord, I feel that. He said, count that as forgiven, son. Come on, get back in here. He pulls him up there up onto the beach like that, puts his arm around him there and gets some water all over him and everything like that. Here, Pete, sit by the fire. You're kind of cold. You've gotten away. You're like that log that got pulled away from the fire and it's kind of charred and burnt up and it's been away from the fire too long. And come on back over here, Peter. Let me light you up again. You say, you believe that? Oh, yeah, I absolutely believe that. And he puts him down there and Peter's looking down there and he said, uh, Peter, are you hungry? And probably five barley loaves and two fishes. And he's thinking, man, Lord, I don't, I don't feel like eating nothing at all. He said, oh, come on, Peter. You see, why is the meal there, preacher? Fellowship, man. Fellowship. That's the real, not just, hey, Peter, come on up here. Let's get right. Let's have a come to Jesus meeting. You know what? He don't even address him until he eats. You know why he eats with him? He's showing he's back in fellowship with him. You read the passage in 1 Corinthians and over in 2 Corinthians. You know what he says? When you're, somebody's out of fellowship with such an one, know not to eat. You know what happened when he reached down there and grabbed a hold of him, Brother Larry? He said, we're back in fellowship, boy. Come on. How do you know that? Sit down. We're going to eat. And then, can you imagine that? Sitting down there and Peter gets ready to reach the skillet. And the Lord said, I got it. Just, just keep your shirt on, man. Gets out a plate and puts him a little napkin over his arm there. And he went up there and he says, here's some of the best fish you ever had. Amen. When my wife and I were over there in Israel, and I recommend you go if you ever get a chance to go, even though it's coming unglued over there and all that, you get a chance to go, you go. You go out there onto the Sea of Galilee. They shut those engines down, man. It was quiet, man. It was just as smooth as glass out there, a little bit cool and that kind of stuff. And my dad got up there and they handed him a microphone and that whole boat's full of people out there on the Sea of Galilee. And he started just preaching and he preached about Peter and the storms on the sea and stuff like that. And then we got done, they cranked the engines up and we went back in. You know what we all got to sit down and do? We got to sit down and eat Peter's fish. That's what they call it. <laughs> I don't know if they shipped it in from somewhere else or not, but they say it came out of the same place. <laughs> but you know what it was? It had a special meaning. Amen. I thought, you know something, I, I bet, I bet it Peter sure appreciated that. That fish up there, and the Lord made that fish for him. I mean, it had to be baked and probably had some lemon and some butter on it and stuff like that. Probably tasted like a ribeye instead of fish. But at any rate, it, it tasted good. And, and then have some fresh bread made. You say, do they, they, yeah, they actually do that. So, oh, that's just a tourist trap. Well, that meant something to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what happened? They sit down there and then the other boys come in. They're about two furlongs out on the side over there. There are a couple furlongs. They start coming in. He said, Pete, you want to help them? Yeah, they pull in the net, 153 fishes in that kind of a thing. And that's interesting, the net doesn't break there. You yeah. all know the thing about that because you get on the right side of the cross and never get out of the net. Yeah. <laughs> First time the net broke. Yes, sir. Get on the other side of Calvary, the net don't break. Amen. <laughs> A little eternal security there for the yeah. fishes. <laughs> Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Yeah, Lord, I sure do love you, boy. Peter's brokenhearted and tore out of the frame. You say, what is that? Peter had to die to all of his failures in the past. Otherwise, you know what would have happened? He'd have stayed out there and been a commercial fisherman. You say, is that what you're talking about, preacher? That's what I'm talking about. 
I'm telling you right now, your flesh is against you. The world is against you. The devil is against you. The deck is stacked against you. And if you don't get over yourself, you're not going to be much of a Christian. Amen. Amen. Some of you struggle so hard in that kind of a thing because you're always so sensitive in and of yourself because you're too much alive. Thank you, Deke. Everybody else kind of got lockjaw there. I'll be glad when I get Brother Ernie back here because then I'll have you and him, amen. And <laughs> present company excluded. Seems like everybody got kind of quiet on that one. The reason you take such great offense to what people say is you're too much alive. Yes, sir. Yes. Amen. That's a little better. I have the same problem. Yes, sir. So, oh, preacher man, you got to hide like a rhinoceros. You might be surprised. You say, why? Things hurt. Yes, sir. Amen. You know what it is? It's a reminder to me. Hey, boy, you're a little too much alive, aren't you? Yes. You need to die, don't you? Amen. <laughs> I'm like, yes, sir, Lord, I guess I do. You know what helps you die? Reading that book every day. Yes. You keep reading that book, you'll be surprised. You can't help but let it change you. Amen. If you're willing to listen to it. All right, now Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 4, where are the time? Give me a couple more minutes here, and I know the kids have got to get a nap here before we leave at dark 30 in the morning. Um, but look, if you will, please run back over again, verse 17. I want to cover two verses. Verse 17, for our light affliction. You just read 2 Corinthians 11. Would you call that light affliction? <laughs> Paul said light affliction. Paul said it wasn't nothing. Light affliction, which is but for a moment. Doesn't last forever. But what does it do? It worketh far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. Everything's not always what you think it is. Sometimes you're going through afflictions and stuff like that. And Paul said, don't worry, it don't last forever. You know what, people, you're strange people if you ever stop and think about it. You're strange in this sense of the word. Not weird, unusual, odd. There's some of that going on for every one of us. We're all that way to a certain degree. But you know what's strange about you? You're living your life. You're here on a Sunday night. Do you know how weird that is? People don't hardly do that anymore. You say, why are you here? Because you're going through things for eternity's sake. Paul said, they're going to laugh at you. They're going to mock you. They're going to make fun of you. It's light affliction. But you know what else he says? He said, it's not going to last forever. You might be in the hospital for a while. You might even pass away in the hospital and now have the grief of someone that's on on the head of you and you have to live with that. But it don't last forever. Amen. You see him on the other side. Amen. I mean, is this, does that do anything for you at all? Yes, yeah. I mean, sometimes it'll last a long time. My dad's been gone for years. I'd love to see my dad. But I understand this. I know that the Lord knew what he was doing when he took him out there. And you know what I realized? I get to spend eternity with him. Well, that's a pretty good trade-off. Yes, you say, what? I don't know what the Lord prevented happening. I don't know why He did what He did. I don't even know that when I get there, I hear people say that stuff, but the longer I think about it, I don't know that I'm going to ask those kind of questions. I don't think you'll see me up there saying, where'd Cain get his wife? You know, or, or asking how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. I, I don't think I'm going to be up there going, well, why did you take my dad when you did? I think, you know what I'll do? I'm just going to let it ride. Yeah. I think I'm just going to accept the fact that by faith he knows more than me than, and, I, and let it go with that. But you know what it is? Paul tells you this. It's light affliction. It doesn't last forever. You'll be out of here in a few years. Literally a few years. If the Lord tarries, what? Maybe for me, 10 years, 15 years, maybe? Before I go completely haywire and completely lose my mind and lose my health and everything. I'm, look, I'm, I'm doing great. I don't, I'm not ready to check out the Mar. Do you understand? But I'm saying, it, even if everything goes great, I'm at the end. And then Paul said, it don't last forever. There's stuff that happened to me 10 years ago. I can't even hardly remember what it was I was so worried about 10 years ago. I'm sure it was some cataclysmic thing I thought was going to be the end of the world. And now I look back on it and go, well, what was that? It's not even around anymore. Paul said, light affliction, but what does it do? It's better for you to go through affliction because it does more for you than the lack of affliction. Amen. Hard choices and sad goodbyes. My dad and I used to have a thing. Whenever it came time to leave and stuff like that, we would just uh, just say, see you later, you know, and we'd leave. And then all that hugging and talking and goodbying and all that stuff and just tear you out of the frame, you know. And so we just got to where, you'll see you later. We'll see you later. When you got ready to pass and saying, I'll see you later. <laughs> you say, well, what is that? Well, that 
that goodbye stuff sounds permanent. Yes, yeah. it does. I just like see you later. Amen. And so you know what? We just say see you later. Amen. Well, you know what? He's gone now. What'll happen? I'll see him one day. Amen. And when I get there, this will be odd to some of you. When I get there, I'll say, boy, we sure have missed you. You've been gone a long time. And he said, I just got here a minute or so ago. He said, son, something's weird up here, man. He said, it's eternity. He said, there's no past. There's no future. There's just, we're just here. Amen. Amen. Light affliction. Last one. Are you ready? This is the definitive one. Hope it's helping you. Maybe encourage you a little bit. Look in verse number 18. Here's a secret. You ready? Verse 18, while we look not at the things that are seen. The church that focuses on the things that are seen all the time is not the right church, ladies and gentlemen. Amen. Somebody that's always telling you about prosperity and politics and prejudices and their own platform and all that kind of stuff, that's stuff here and now. That ain't going to help that young'un when she goes off to school what it's going to be. She ain't going to live right and do right if she's just thinking about here and now. Yeah. I hope to God she doesn't, but she could do things that mom and daddy won't know about. Preacher won't know nothing about. Maybe even friends won't know nothing about it. If she's not thinking, somebody else knows about it. Right. I'm all you kids that are leaving and going to college this year around, I'm going to make a special tape for you. It's called Watching You. <laughs> <laughs> And then I'm going to have it played every day for you so you memorize all the words. It's a real easy thing. <laughs> watching you, watching you, watching you. There's an all-seeing eye watching you. David said, though I make my bed in hell, thou art there. Yes. God knows. But now watch. We look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are what? All right, now let me show you something about that because that's real important. Because you know what Paul says over there in Philippians? He said, I press toward the mark and the high calling of God. Paul said, I fight not as one that beateth the air. I want my licks to count. Why? Because I'm headed somewhere else. I press toward the mark and the high calling of God. My eyes are on eternity. I'm trying to tell you that when it comes to a church, you're looking for a church that tells you the wicked things that are going on in the world like we've been over and the bad things that are going on in the world, but it's always having you turn upward. It's always having you think about eternity. It's got you looking for the Lord. If I could get you enough looking at the Lord, you know what it'll do? That Bible says, unless it's a liar, it'll purify you. I see y'all probably don't have a problem with purity in your life. You're probably just pure as a driven snow. We look up, you know, what's purity. We see a picture of you right there by that, you know, as an illustration. But for me, that purity thing, I mean pure. Yes. I mean no guile, no trick, no sarcasm, no just pure, clean like that. You know what that Bible says? He that haveth this hope in him purifieth himself. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. That verse has probably helped me more than many other verse in the Bible. You say, why? Even before I'm standing in the pulpit, I'm thinking, if I was doing what I'm about to do, and Jesus were to come back and catch me, right. Amen. I'm thinking... I think maybe I better not do that. <laughs> you say, oh, preacher, that's just ridiculous. Well, but, but what if the time you decide to right. do it, yeah. right. it is the one time you do get caught, yeah. and he bursts the sky wide open and hollers, come up hither, and you're like, can you imagine if you got a big old baseball-sized chaw on the side of your mouth, and you're just about ready to split, you know? And all of a sudden, the rapture happens and you're... <laughs> and the Lord calls you first. <laughs> Speak up, son. <laughs> well, preacher, can't you chew tobacco in heaven? <laughs> yeah, but you got to go to hell to spit. <laughs> Can you imagine? Fire it up. Bam! The rapture happens. You're... And the Lord calls you up first and asks you to speak and you... You dope smokers, man. You're getting that last hit. 
I've seen a man. <laughs> I mean, they're blowing up like a helium balloon about to bust and bam, the rapture happens, you know, and they're red eyes, hungry, got the munchies. And you're thinking, where's the marriage supper of the lamb? And the Lord's like, what you going to do with that? Don't worry, Mr. Clinton's not going to be there saying, I did not inhale. <laughs> you ever think about it? Oh, preacher, that's just flat silly. No. No, it'll help you. Paul closes out that chapter, ladies and gentlemen, because he's trying to tell you the church in the end of everything by giving you certain things to do and rules to live by. They're trying to help you. And Paul gives you some things in those last three verses right there that can become a key component to you living the life that you so badly want to do. It'll help you ingrain the right habits. And there's nothing that's in there that is hard or you have to be unbelievably brilliant to be able to get it. You do have to practice it. And if you don't practice it, you can have the greatest goal in the world. I'm going to read my Bible through this year. And if you don't change your habits, this year will be the same as all the years before when you've tried. Amen. But if you change those habits and you follow Paul's teaching, you'll be surprised. You'll come out. Here's the, here's the thing, and I'm done. The Lord wants to see you succeed. Amen. He doesn't take pleasure when you mess up. He just can't wait to uh, uh, tune you up. He doesn't want to do that. Any of you guys got to have kids or grandkids and you just can't wait for them to mess up because you just bought a new paddle? Come on, kid, mess up, man. I'm, I'm, oh boy. Hurry up and mess up. I want to see, drilled me some holes in this one, man. I can, yeah, I've been working out, man. I can't, no. You know what you like? You like when they come over and they don't mess up. Don't you? Father, we sure appreciate your